Good evening. Tonight we're going to answer the question, if you want to refinish your gun, the different ways you can do it, the different types of finishes you can do. And we have a special guest for that tonight, and that is going to be Chris Magnet from Title II Manufacturing. What's up, Chris? Hey, everybody. Hey, Lindsay. Hey, Joe. And, and we have another special guest with us tonight. Again, we have Lindsay Guns here. Hey, Lindsay. Hey, everybody. Are you talking loud enough? I hope so. Okay, you're soft, and we're sharing mics here. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, Chris, <laughs> I think, uh, and we're friends. Yeah, very close. We, uh, we do business together. Um, let me just start off by saying you build some really cool, remember this is on the radio, we got to watch right, what yeah, you say, yeah. really cool stuff. I mean, some of your rifles are probably some of the best built out there right now. Oh, I appreciate that, John. Um, and you manufacture rifles and everything you do um, for pretty much almost every budget. Every budget, everything. Uh, we're a full custom shop. So yeah. if you want to come to me and get, you know, I, mean, I don't know your taste, but if you wanted a pink American flag rifle, he's talking to Lindsay right now, folks, right, not like, me. <laughs> that's debatable, but we, you know, we well, I do that have. later. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, I can do that for you and say you want to do it on a on a budget build, like say you don't have two, three thousand dollars to go build a rifle, you have like five or six hundred bucks. We can do that. We can make that happen for you. Uh, now, would this be a bolt action or an AR style or well, AK? It, it all depends. I mean, you can get something cheap in a bolt action. You're just going to be caliber specific so something that cheap in that budget line you're going to be looking more towards a 22 things like that you know and listen if somebody's coming to you for bolt action um they're not looking for the 500 dollar no bolt sir. action no sir we build rifles at title two that get uh we average about one tenth moa and i know that's hard for a lot of people to believe um but we started with f class guns and we've we've got the recipe down and uh we don't it's hard to put it out there and say that we we can always guarantee that kind of accuracy because the gun's going to do what it's going to do. The shooter is what manipulates the firearm, correct? So well, we got a cool story for that later on. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we've gotten uh, three out of five rifles to get one tenth MOA. A couple more were just shy of that. That's I've had crazy. One rifle in three hundred wind mag at seven hundred yards get uh, almost like a triangle, point three three separation of an inch. So just like a perfect triangle of circles. So Folks, that, that is cool. close. Right. At um, what distance? 700 yards. 700 yards. Right. I so, get tired walking or driving 700 yards. I'm not walking it. We do that with uh, the AR platform as well. You know, the AK platform can be a little different, you know. Plus, there's other guys out there that specialize in the AK platform that can yes. really tune that out far. Um, so we specify more about the AR platform, the bull gun platform. I'm an AR guy. I'm not a huge sure. AK fan. I want to get one because I have some ideas, and we can talk about that off the radio. Right, right. Uh, but... I'm an AR guy. Lindsay, what are you? AR versus AK? Yes. AR all the way. Mm. Okay. America. Absolutely. Yeah. America, absolutely. baby. Mm -hmm. That's right. And we have talked about you doing a gun for me before. That's right. Yeah. We have a few ideas we for you still to have do. To, we still have to put that sure. together. But let's answer the question a little bit about coatings first. Um, I think some of the first thing you things you've done for us here at the shop were the Cerakote. Right. We've done a lot of stuff for you, different coating-wise. Yes. I mean, and what you need someone to do is not just say, Cerakote's the only way to go. This no. PVD is the only way to go. You know, nickel chrome, hard chrome, this is the only way to go, right? No. What you need to do is go to your professional or to your, like, come to Aegis, come mm -hmm. see you, and tell us what you're going to use your gun for. Like, is this going to be a gun that's granddad's old gun from the war that you want to restore and keep it 200 years more? Bingo. And you want to put it on display? You know, let's, let, let's break that down the way it came from the factory. Let's get the letters from Colt or whatever company they came from. Let's blew it the way it came, and let's make that factory fresh. What was that one you did, 1908? Right, so we, we specialize a lot in the 1903-1908 Colt pocket hammerless platforms in 32 and 380. There's not a lot of companies out there that will do that because they are tricky to reassemble. However, what we do is we take them, say, you know, I mean, this is a gun that Patton carried underneath as a carry gun. Uh, John Dillinger carried these. It was a gangster gun of the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Very popular gun. You know, I need to give me one of those now. Oh, they're great. We have four. <laughs> like I got three or four that are coming to you in the next few weeks. Nice. Um, and we redo the whole thing make it factory refresh, or we can do it maybe different for you. Like, say you want to upgrade it for the new century. Let's do it nickel chrome, or let's hard chrome it. You know, you don't want to ever use pearl-handled grips. Patton didn't agree with that. He agreed with <laughs> ivory. <laughs> There's a famous quote about that. So, in fact, Colt does make some ivory that's, uh, it's like bonded, so it's been ground out from old ivory and bonded together with epoxy. Okay. So they can, we can emulate those old things. And then, that's awesome. as you know, we give you a nice case, a nice little uh, presentation box. So yeah, that had a nice wooden box. Was that sure. the red velvet or red something interior? We put uh, red straps to hold it open, and then okay. that, that was a velvet lined. Yeah, right. yeah. that was gorgeous. We do a few things like that. We always try to do something special so that you feel 
special when you open the box. You know? I always feel special. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, so yeah. when you come to you, you got to ask him, like, is this gun I'm going to go hunting with? Because then Cerakote applies. Is this something yes. that you want to do decoratively? Then Cerakote applies. Or even the one person that had that, it was a $200 1911. Sure. And he wanted to re-blow it. You're not right. going to re-blow it for 200 bucks. No, you can go buy fact, a new gun. A lot of people think that just bluing something means taking it apart, dipping in a hot tank of, of the bluing solution. We make our own that are proprietary, so we don't release that information. Um, but we, it, it's a, it's a concoction of bluing salts. We can say that basically. It's in your, gotcha. it's a caustic bath of a certain temperature that actually adds a layer of protection over the gun. So most people think you can just drop it in there and go. But when you give me that two hundred dollar gun. You know, we have to say the tops, you know, satin. We got to bead blast that. Then we got to fix all the pits. We got to fix all the, we got to re. Uh, That's why you wanted it done. It was all pitted up sure. and rusted. And right. And by the time we get it done running it through a surface grinder or polishing it out or doing the grain or anything like that, I mean, you're looking at on average four to 600 just for a basic re blue. And right? it takes you how many hours? That's probably. Oh, all day long. I mean. That's a good price. Right. That's a good price. You're yeah. tying up your, right. your whole day just to do one gun. Right, like full restorations on a 19, 1903 or the 1911s, mm -hmm. things like that, the old or the little revolvers, the Colt revolvers, things like yeah. that, you're looking about about $1,000 nowadays because wow. huh. we don't just do, we don't just shine it up for you. You know, we're going to remove those pittings. We're going to, re, we work with a local company called AccuBeam mm -hmm. and we've gotten with them and they, a lot of people don't know that they actually do factory roll mark engravings. Do they? So we have gotten with them and designed the actual engraving patterns for the Colt 1903 line and the 1911 lines, which have multiple fonts in their alphabet. So it's not just something you can go scan and go with. Oh, wow. So we've gotten with them and, and taken care of that. So we replace all those factory engravings. We go through the guns with a fine microscope, or if you will, like a loop, find any little stamps or, <clears throat> excuse me, any proof marks, things like that, and make sure they're back in the original factory location. 1911, 1903, 1908 have a problem with the horse always being in a different location, right? Okay. So when we get them, we make sure that they're there. We center them, we measure them, so that they're in the exact same location. And sometimes people will say, "Hey, it's a brand new restoration. You I paid you X amount of dollars for it. Why is this horse in the wrong place?" Well, it's not. If you go back to the original pictures in a letter from Colts, and plus we, anything from Colts is great because you can contact them. You pay them oh, hundred bucks, yeah. and they'll sell you exactly how it left the factory, if, who it went to. If you're into investing in, in guns, you can't go wrong with Colts. <laughs> They're all the semi-automatics, especially the revolvers, right. are awesome. Actually, behind you back there in one of the cases way back there is a Bye -bye, 1922 police positive and a 38 Smith & Wesson. They're great. They're yeah. great guns. I couldn't imagine carrying that on the job. That would have been crazy. Tiny, though. <laughs> but they did. You know, police, yeah. they had a different job back then. They didn't roll. Yeah. But. but I've seen you've done some uh, blowing for me. It came out awesome. Um, I think you still have my Smith & Wesson. Yeah, it's a Model 1. Model right, 1. Have one of the first ones they ever made. Um, having problems with the cylinder. I'm trying to get a lot of that pitting out. and It was in rough shape. Yeah, and getting some of that engraving out is really difficult. So shy of making a new one and keeping that one as a spare for show, you know, it's 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 been, it's been proven a difficult task to restore that one oh, so far. But it is possible. It will be done. Now, <laughs> now I got to get into this, and this will be probably a whole segment on, on Cerakote. Right. Extremely popular. Sure. It's roughly inexpensive compared to bluing, chroming, or anything else. Sure. Yep. Um, and you can do all different types of patterns. Right. Now, folks, have you ever seen any of those uh, guns that we posted with the American flag themes, the uh, like grayscale American flags, would you call mm -hmm. it that? That's this guy right here that's doing those. Um, he just did one for the NRA that people went nuts over. Um, you did the American Legion. Yep, did that one. We did another one for the law enforcement ones with the thin blue, the blue line. line. Right. Um, they were just awesome. They're incredible. People are going nuts over them. Social media, everything. Um, you're the guy to do this stuff. Cerakote's a great product. <laughs> if it's done correctly. Right. A lot of companies don't prep properly. Like it's always prep, 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 prep. Everybody knows mm -hmm. from painters, from house painters to, and I don't call it Cerakote painting because it's not, it's no. coating. But anything that involves anything, right? If you, your preparation is key to great success, right? Yes. So if we don't do the steps that Cerakote recommends or requires to to get a, a perfect finish you won't get perfect finish and we we we've use, come across those before oh we can um yeah we've definitely come across those we before. won't mention the shop but we got a gun one day that we took in as a trade-in and uh it looked really good at first and uh one of our guys that was working here went to go clean it using standard cleaning chemicals 
And he comes back out to me, and the cloth that he was using was turning gray. Mm -hmm. So it was a grayish finish on the gun. He's like, is this supposed to do that? No. Uh, we actually did a video on it. I mean, I just rubbed my thumbnail across the slide of the gun, mm -hmm. and the finish came right off. Yeah, your nails are made of keratin, which are softer than almost anything, so yeah. shouldn't do that. No, not at all. You're a pretty smart guy knowing that, <laughs> what your nails are made out of. I just know they're made out of nails. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it, it came right off. It was horrible. And right. just from my experience, you know, painting motorcycles, stuff like that, the surface was never prepped. Sure. Now, it's a different – now, when we when you prep for, like, paint, like PTG or PPG paints, whatever, yeah. it's a different process because yeah. we're not going to, like, say rough blast the metal or things like yeah. that because – with that kind of paint, we're putting a layer, a covering, a coating, right? right? We're putting something on top of the metal. Yeah. Cerakote's different. Cerakote is actually a ceramic-based coating that will actually bond on a molecular level with the metal that it's going to under heat. So under under heat, the molecules of the ceramic coating yeah. and the metal become one. So that's why you can do almost anything with it. You're going to have a gun in a boat, Cerakote it. You're going to have a gun in the, in the woods, you know, make sure it's Cerakote it. Yeah. A lot of guys bring in their two, three thousand dollars Satori's that they want to go shoot pigeons with out in the fields, but they don't want to have it all rust and blue mm -hmm. and things like that. So we either Cerakote or have them PVD. PVD is another great option. It's what your new like your Glock 19 X is with, and a lot of military yeah. options like the Sig Legion. But uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure we can. Listen, we got to take a quick break. When we return, we're going to finish our conversation about the Cerakote. Then we get into some of those other coatings out there. But we will be back in just. And we're back. Thanks for sticking with us. I am Joe, and tonight I am joined by Miss Lindsay Guns and Chris Magnet of Title II Manufacturing. Uh, we just we were talking about Cerakote and some of these yeah. other coatings. Um, now the prep process you were talking about. Walk me through this. You have to sandblast it, sand it down. Right. So what? some guns like AKs are just laden with grease mm -hmm. things like that. So you don't want to just go toss that in your sandblaster. No. So we'll give those a pre clean. You know, we'll prep those, and we've devised a way to clean that with a hot tank. But from there, what you want to do is to get your old finish off. Yes, for you're going to sandblast it in 120 mm -hmm. aluminum oxide media. And that's going to get everything out of the little nooks and crannies. Because like I said earlier, it's going to bond with the metal. It's not going to yeah. cover it, right? So any imperfections in the metal, like say it's, you say you blast it and then throw your keys on it and scratch it. That's going to show up in the Cerakote. Yes. So you, it has to be perfect. Now from there, once you sandblast it, you blow it off with an air gun and you're going to bake it. That's called gas out. Right, and this is what takes a lot of time. A lot of coders like to skip this process, um, this step. So in gas out, what you're doing is you're heating the metal up to force the oils and all the solvents, cosmoline, any crap, if you will, out of the metal, okay? Mm -hmm. Now from there, if you have oil or anything seeping out, you're going to go ahead and soak that in an acetone bath or a brake clean bath, a solvent bath that you can then get that all that stuff mm -hmm. out, put it back into the oven, and you're going to keep doing this back and forth process until everything is out. AKs can take a day, right? If they're if you don't oh, use sure, a hot bath nasty. and you keep going back and forth and back and forth, so I mean they can, some of them can be tough, right? So from that point, you want to make sure everything's off of it, right? Now they used to require you'd use a bath again, like an acetone bath, but now I think they changed the rule where we just have to. Uh, it's been a while since I did the thing, but you have to just blast it out with an air with air, okay, with compressed air to go because they changed their formula. So we once you blast that all out, make sure nothing's on it, then you'll spray it. Now, this is where the hard part is because it's only going to be half to two mils thick depending on the color. Now, that's very thin. So you have these auto body guys that are getting into it going, and they're spraying layers, man. Oh, yeah. And you get it, and it's thick. And that's that's not how it works. It actually is detrimental to the coating to do that. Yeah. So to pull off these uh, patterns, if you will, in the mm -hmm. paint themes, um, there's intervals in which you have to flash it off so once we have that first coating down we, we we would bake it for a certain amount of time and then pull it out so it's tacky but it's not tacky okay. right so it's 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 curing but it's not curing. you're right in that in that gray area and then depending on the pattern you have to stay in that gray area okay and you'll go ahead and finish baking the cure process again some of your stuff that you do was just awesome now how about mm -hmm. for let's say your glock because you've done all my concealed carry glocks for me right um and you do them in the I know nobody likes it anymore, the distress or war-torn look. Sure. Uh, the reason why I like that look is so when I scratch it, it doesn't bother me at all. Right. It's my carry gun. I'm going to scratch it. It's a tool. And it also depends on your holster. Now, yes. a lot of guys like the Kydex holsters. Mm -hmm. They're great. They're awesome, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're going to spend you know, $500, $550 on a Glock mm -hmm. and get you another $200, $250 paint job on it mm -hmm. and then go put it and rub it up against a piece of plastic, I mean, that's like saying I'm going to take um, – 
my cell phone with no case on it and go rub it up on my new Corvette. Yeah. Probably not going to happen. You, can, ah! you know? <laughs> so. <laughs> Would that be for the phone or the Corvette? Probably both. But probably both. <laughs> the price of phones nowadays. So, but a good leather holster, you know, you're mm -hmm. not going to really do much to it. Yeah. Um, that's what I would use, a good leather holster. Yeah. Um, a lot of times, those guys aren't buying these guns to carry, you know, but if they do, they just change yeah. the color. That's great, you know, and the Kydex will work. Now, Cerakote will last longer than almost 90 other, 90 percent of all the other coatings out there, 99 percent of all the other coatings out there, but it's not impervious. Nothing's impervious to scratching. No. Right, so it's it, it will happen, right? But a good holster maker, like HPC or, you know, whoever you guys yeah. use, uh, they can make it and they can build the holster so it's not going to wear it'll pinch towards the frame and it won't actually mess up your gun as much yes. you know but the only way to get avoiding that is to either not use it which is silly yeah. or you get like a a, yeah. a nylon or a, a leather holster or something that's not going to you get the up. nylon you get the synthetic materials you get right. the leather i mean there's stuff out there and that point you treat it more like a blued gun you yeah. know, for scratch for scratch resistance. Let me again, if my yeah. Glock forty three or something like that scratches, um yeah. oh well. Yeah, you know a guy. Yeah, I know a guy <laughs> first off. You've already done it. Um but I don't care. It's it's a tool. Right. Now if I had that gorgeous American flag theme one, yeah, I'd be a little upset there. Now a lot of guys talk about the Legion. Like the Legion and oh, the, the Glock six hour Legion. Right. Those are P V D code. That's different. Yeah. P V D is a uh, poly vapor distortion, I believe. And it's like a hundred fifty thousand dollar machine. They're made here in Sarasota. And what happens is they take these raw metal pieces, like tin coat is PVD, right? He's right uh, behind us. Nickel bond, uh, nickel boron, PVD, mm -hmm. right? So what happens is they put them on these metal racks, all the parts, and then they negatively and positively charge. So you negatively charge the part and positively charge the air, and then all the paint molecules get drawn in. So your barrels are actually coated on the inside. So when you see these barrels that are... Mel uh, not melanin, it's different, but when you can look down a new barrel and you see inside like a tin-coated barrel, right, and you see how it's all gold inside, that's that's what it's doing. And you understand right now, Chris is actually looking down the barrel like you can see him. Yeah. <laughs> but you can see if you go on our Facebook page after the show, go on YouTube and yeah. everything else. And you should be going to YouTube to watch this. We're beautiful people. We are. Take a yeah. look at us, everybody. Wave. All right. We always <laughs> wave. <laughs> but, yeah, the coatings are great. Your Cerakote finishes are just awesome. You did some custom... Uh, what were those, Marlins or Mossbergs? No, nah, that was fun. That was really fun. You and I did that. So yeah, that was. We got these rails to do the. Uh, it's, it was a lever. Winchester action. used to make the 1864, right? Yeah. And they went out of business. They moved to Turkey, whatever. Long story. And then so the New Haven plant was sold to Mossberg. So what Mossberg did, they said, we're going to do the same tooling with the same parts for the same gun and make everything the same. So, but the company that makes the rails, Midwest Industries, at the time, I don't know if they do it now yet or not only made the rail for a Marlin. Well, the screw locations for the barrel tanks are, all right, so the part that holds the barrels together <laughs> towards the end, right, the little round clips, they're in two different locations. And because of the taper of the barrel, the cone shape of the actual barrel over the length of overall is what determines where those pieces fit, right? Mm -hmm. So to be able to use that, I had to make another piece and set it back and actually mount, make a new mounting location in that rail. And then use a pretty long set screw to mount that as a pressure point off the mag tube, so it's actually sturdier than you'd think. I mean, that's pretty solid. Oh, they were, yeah, yeah they were solid. Yeah. And the cool thing is, we had the client come in. And he was a really good guy. Um, a cool story. We're not going to get into that with him, but he came in with a picture of a concept gun, and pretty much said, "That's what I want." Yeah. And Chris was able to do that for us. I mean, this thing was, and the client was more than happy about everything. We, it we at Title Two, we try to never say no, right? Yeah. So. I come from the restaurant business where the customer's always right, and yeah, I don't care what you're changing. We got to do it. If I have broccoli, I'm going to make broccoli, right, because you yeah. want it. So I don't believe in impossible situations, right? So I will take it from you, and I will tell you, I don't know if I can do this, but we're going to do a heck of a lot of research on this to make sure this project works out the way that you want. And when you break it down to it, guns are wood and metal, sometimes plastic. Mm -hmm. Those are all malleable substances. We can make it work. Yeah. For the most part. <laughs> it may not look pretty, but it'll work. <laughs> <laughs> no, these actually look pretty. And did you see them, Lindsay? I don't believe so. You weren't here, I guess? No. No, go figure. But they were good-looking guns. He was more than happy. And they were actually for his kids. Mm -hmm. I think they were twins, and they were like 10 years old. I saw the pictures on Facebook. Yes, they were pretty. you got to follow us on Facebook, <laughs> folks. Um, so what other type of finishes are you doing? Um, like if well, I brought you my... 
whatever Glock or whatever. Right. What else can you do to it? Finish right. Hard chrome. We can do nickel chrome. We can do nickel. Well, not nickel chrome. Nickel, hard chrome, mm-hmm. which hard chrome come black, whatever. We do bluing, niter bluing, which a lot, a lot of people do a lot. Um, that was what you were doing, though. I was at your shop the other day. Yeah, that's where they come out super bright, bright blue, the little yes. parts. And that's that's not a protective coating at all. Like yeah. You can blow air on that and it'll scratch. Really? But it's so pretty. It is pretty. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to do so. just a, a trophy piece or uh, well, a safe queen. Yeah. Right. Well, when people, for, if people want an example of PVD, you know the Kimber sapphires? They're yes. like blue and purple. That's PVD. Okay. That's PVD. And Kimber has the recipe for blue and won't share. Got to love You won't share your recipe. Well, I'm not knocking them. I'm just saying. <laughs> you got to love them for it. You, you, <laughs> protect yourself. You got to make money somehow. Mm-hmm. So, what else do you do? We actually do a lot of stuff. Um, there's not much we don't do. We're getting into the knife making thing right now. Um, so, oh, I saw those on uh, your uh, Instagram page. Right, right. I got a buddy, um, uh, pain, uh, pain knives. They make them out. They make me the blanks right now because um, I don't, I haven't gotten set up with the tooling yet. I just wanted to sure. see if I could do it first. And mm-hmm. I'd, some, you take a shot, you gamble. Sometimes it works, and it seems to have worked. So, awesome. Um, I get the blanks from him. Uh, I do cutlery for chefs, so I do a full knife set, full knife set for chefs. I do hunting blades, uh, karambits, which I'm not my favorite one to do, but I, I will do those. I do a lot of skinning knives that'll accompany you for like carry. Yes. You know, so you could all fix blades. I can do the open uh, folders, folders, but I'm not the biggest fans of those. I mean, other companies make really good ones for that are already being used. So you gotta find your niche with that, right? A lot of the people like fix fix blades out there, mm-hmm. and I haven't had the chance to play with yours yet. Yeah, we're bringing you a few. You're we're bringing, bringing a few? you a few. Yeah. When are you bringing them? Uh, you're, I got three for you now. I'm waiting on the boxes. Uh, okay. And then I got probably two two or three more coming. That's awesome. Right. So what are you using for the grips? I can use anything. I mean, I can use a bone and dye a bone. But, but we'll, what we're typically using is burl. Box, elder, koa, um, just any kind of burl wood. And we stabilize that with cactus, cactus juice, which is actually a, a hard epoxy. So you'll be able to take these knives. And I mean, no chef knife or good knife should ever go in a dishwasher. So help you whatever you believe in but what you should do is just clean it with warm water that was a conversation soap, this morning a little bit house. of mineral oil on the blade <laughs> that's about the only thing you should ever do mineral oil you put on the blade just like your cutting board because it won't attract the bacteria like you say olive oil will because that comes from a plant you know it's so a mineral oil won't have anything to break down afterwards okay i, n- I never knew that <clears throat> i knew about the washing machine i feel like i just got in trouble all over again mm. my wife gets in trouble for those a lot <laughs> <laughs> it happens so but happens. we are we are uh at our heart at our core a custom rifle manufacturer yes so we spe- we i specialize in bolt guns and I, I say i but i mean we i mean anybody everybody entitled to anybody involved entitled to is part of the family right so we don't just like say build you a rifle for x amount of dollars because they're not cheap right the bolt guns and say here go learn how to shoot it right we're with you every step of the process so just because you know you're gonna buy a gun the relationship doesn't end there Right, so we set a time, maybe a month, six months, a year from now, and you and I'll go out to the range, and we'll give you a full class on how to run that weapon system, how to set that weapon system up. We set it to you, and um, I think we had a break coming up, so I'm sure I can tell you a little bit more. We do. I want, I want you to talk about the one you were telling us before we uh, went on air tonight. Okay, because yeah, that one sounds cool, and it's a unique caliber that most people probably don't know about. Right, but apparently it's going to be extremely uh, popular. What's coming up? It's coming up it's really coming. big in PRS right now. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to find out when we return. Be back in a minute. And we're back. Again, tonight we're joined by Chris Magna, a Title II manufacturing, and we got the wonderful Miss Lindsay Guns here with us. Hello. Hi. Uh, Lindsay, got to throw <laughs> some input in this thing. Do you want the bolt action rifle? I'm not the biggest fan of bolt actions. We have talked about doing a gun for me, though. Mm-hmm. I just shake my head. Wait, sorry. No. I am, I, I'm going to be honest, I'm not going to lie, I'm a handgun guy yeah. in and out. Um, I like ARs, but... The reason why I like handguns so much is because I carry one every day. Right. I don't hunt, but I would like to look go into some long range shooting maybe later sure. on. I mean, I probably have so. thirteen guns. I think three of them are long. Yeah. The rest are all handguns. So I got long handguns. Well, you got big, got big hands. I do have big hands. That. Um, well, listen, Chris, you were telling me about the rifle that I'm a little happy. This is something I would probably want sure. in a year or so. But uh, what caliber is this thing you're building? So we're building one in six millimeter Creedmoor, not six five, not six point five, not six point five, six millimeter Creedmoor, six millimeter. Right. And what's the difference between those two rounds? Point five millimeters. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I knew you were going to be that guy eventually. Um, uh, why, why do that instead of a 6.5? The ballistics, uh, the ballistic coefficient, the weights of the bullets, the overall lengths. I mean, they're, they're very similar, right? Okay. But if you look at them ballistically, the 6 millimeters is going to squeeze out just a little bit more love what I call accuracy, right? So okay. that's, to me, and that, that can be a matter of opinion for anybody, Chevy versus Ford versus Toyota. I mean, oh, whatever, this is all, but, yeah. Right. However, it is a very popular round in F-Class. It is an up-and-coming round in in uh, PRS, in fact. Now, would, you keep saying F-Class and PRS. What okay. are those? So F-Class is a competition that only, uh, you, you shoot from a prone position or a bench position, right? Mm -hmm. And you shoot from 223 to 308 are the, only in, are the distance of calibers you can use. And it's at 600 yards. And these are the guys that are getting hole in hole at 600 yards. These are the guns, the big bolt guns that are 45, 50 pounds, have big bull barrels, right. the flat bottoms so they can sit perfectly flat, and the big bipods. Yes. Yeah, so these are these are the types of things that are made for extreme accuracy, right? Now, that's not something relatively good for, you know, counter sniper interdiction or anti-personnel interdiction or just, say, hunting purposes hunting, per se, yeah. right? So that's not something that's going to work too well. But the caliber is the same. The twist rates are the same. The barrels are the same. And so let's figure, that's where 6.5 Creedmoor came for, is F-Class. Right? Okay. Same thing. Now, PRS is the Precision Rifle Series. Now, it's been around for a while. And what it was is it's only gained a lot of popularity in the last five years. PRS is like, uh, it's like three gun on steroids, but it's for one <laughs> gun, right? So you have this bolt gun, and you only want one gun because your kit can be expensive. I mean, you're talking scopes, mounts, uh, night vision capabilities, the rifle. I mean, it, it's, it's a big chunk of change. So you want to be able to go use it, not just look at it. So PRS was developed for you to go into multiple different stages, like, say, 12 stages in a, in a match, right? First stage, you'll have to lay in a bench and stand up, go set your gun on a, on a rest, take three shots, go to a different position, take three shots, go to a different position, take three shots, clear, and then that would be the first stage. And some of them will be unknown distances. Okay. It's all different scenarios for you to shoot your gun in different – like, I've shot a gun upside down. Like, literally, make you land a gun, lay on the ground and shoot it upside down, downrange. So there's you have, I've so done you're it. laying on your back, right? Shooting I've, a gun. I've done it laying on on beds that move. All right, I've done it. On, I take a cradle. You're rocking the cradle. I'd fall fact, asleep. Silencer Co. <laughs> just did a PRS match this week, right, or, la or over the weekend okay. before the July, and they had an old mining crane, right? So you would go up to the mining crane and go all the way out to the very end of the crane, and as you were as it was your turn to shoot, the crane went up and down. So you had to, a lot of shooting on the move, a lot of it's unknown like a video distances. Game. Yeah, it's, it's like Mario Brothers. It or something is like that. super <laughs> cool. PRS. I don't believe there's any shooting in Mario Brothers. I thought there was in the one series. I don't think so. <laughs> so to marry that gap, right? People mm -hmm. wanted the most accurate they could get, but you can't go running, you know, 300 yards between between stages with your heart get your heart rate going, carrying a 50 pound rifle. I mean, some guys do it, but you know, I'm not going to run 300 I'm yards without the rifle. I'm not going to run 300 yards at all. But yeah. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> So the idea was to take those calibers that are super accurate at a, at a like bench shooting. We all know what bench rest shooting is, right? Yes. And then aft class and things like that. So the idea was to take the principles of that ballistic accuracy, that love, and apply that to a lighter weight platform. You've seen <coughs> companies uh, like Geisley have done this with their new platform in 260. Uh, a lot of Marine Corps are testing the six. A lot of Marine Corps units are testing the six five. Okay. So they're using these PRSE smaller rounds in the 260 category to get better accuracy at range you know so okay that's a those are what those two come from so you're building one of these right six millimeter cream word right. mm -hmm. uh what kind of scope are you gonna put on there i haven't decided yet um i like i'm, I'm pretty picky about scopes but you can it's you have to be it's really easy to buy a scope really easy okay it has to be front focal plane or first focal plane you want a mill based reticle and you want a mill based turret what that means is for for front focal plane you know you bought a front focal plane because it's about a grand Right, starting right, so you know you've you've paid for that. And you, why is it so expensive? Because the the actual crosshairs in the reticle don't move, right? You you zoom in and out, so your zero never changes ever. Whereas on these other ones, like a second focal plane, if you're on hmm. three, it's a different zero than nine or a different zero than seven, right? So that's that's having said that, mil mil is is the most important key to it, right? So commonly we're set up with an MOA minute of angle, right? But we have a mill-based reticle system in all of our scopes. We all know what a mill dot is, right? It's the, the crosshair with the three, four dots on it. Yes. When you have those, mills are built in tens. Now, our unit of measurement in America is built on tens, so it's easy for us to understand mills. But when you take MOA on that, when I measure my mills, I then have to do a separate calculation to, 
to uh, convert that to an MOA so I can go to four clicks. So it's, I'm running my, basically I'm running my reticle in tens and I'm running my clicks and my turrets in fours. So that's not what you want, right? So to eliminate that, when we build the rifles for people, we recommend three or four scopes depending on their budget. And you can get a good front focal plane scope, mill mill for about a grand. Better ones out to five or six grand. I'll explain why they're so expensive in a second. But when you have the mill based turret and the mill based reticle, like say, once you're all zeroed up, have your ammo and your gun tuned and timed in, that's a whole other conversation. But <laughs> once you have it zeroed, ready to go, and I say, Joe, do you see that steel plate down there at 435? I want you to shoot that gun 435 yards. You get one shot to hit the plate, right? So you're going to go to your data card, which you'll print off from your, from like Hornet Day or whatever that's congruent to your rifle's characteristics and your ballistics from your bullets that you bought from them. Yeah. And it'll say, well, on average, you're come up for 435 yards, which would be the amount of clicks you need to go up, right? Yes. Will be 4.5, right? Now, that doesn't mean one, two, three, four, and then half, right? That means... Every 10 clicks, there's a big number. One, two, three, four. You're just going to go to four, and one, two, three, four, five. And you're going to nail it. Ding. So it makes, it's easier for people that are grew up in America with the tens and the, ten, yes. and the idea of our money, tens, everything, to just mm -hmm. make it really simple. People overcomplicate shooting far. Oh, yeah. It's very, very simple. But it's very hard, you know. So. That's patience right there. Right. Then the waiting to go to the target. <laughs> right. Now you can go on like Optics Planet or AegisTactical.com and you can go see that there's Schmidt and Bender scopes for five, six grand. There's, mm -hmm. you know, there's Leopolds that are four, five, six. So this grand. is one of the things you do, too you offer as a service. When they buy the gun from you, you're going to help them. Oh, we'll get you all set up. Take the notes. best scope yeah. that they can get. For what you need it for, yes. right? Okay. And uh, with scopes, buy more than you need, always. You know, oh, yeah. Rule of thumb, if your gun, if your, our bolt guns start at 3,800, right? So yeah. you're going to want to buy at least a $2,000 scope, $1,500 scope. Oh, yeah. Right. Now from there, the reason that these Schmitten benders and these things are so expensive, four, five, six, seven thousand dollars, is because if I'm if I'm at the range or I'm, if I'm hunting per se and I'm shooting across a valley at 900 yards, and I'm using that scope and I'm, I know where this deer is going to be, right? Because it's right on his path, but I got to sit there for 12, 14 hours watching this thing through a piece of glass. You wear glasses, don't you, Joe? Yes, I do. Your eyes hurt at the end of the day sometimes, <laughs> don't they? They hurt all day so long. So if you don't wear glasses and you're <laughs> looking through this scope, right, like a Nikon all day long, you're going to get a crazy migraine because your eye's out of focus, right? The Schmitten Benders, the, the, these huge, and I say that because they make a really good, really expensive scope. It's like five, six grand. But what it is is the glass and the optics are so clear. The lenses are so clear that you can look at it all day long, take your eye out and be fine. It, you don't get the blurriness. Huh. You don't get anything. That's why they're so expensive. It has nothing to do with the name or anything like that. I'm all for buying expensive optics. Mm -hmm. Even when people buy ARs, we always tell the people you're going to spend more on the optic than you did on the oh, rifle mm -hmm. in most cases, um, unless you're getting a real high-end one. But if you're buying the basic off-the-shelf AR, you're spending a couple hundred dollars more on the optic. Sure. I mean, your ACOG is what, a grand? Starting off, yeah. yeah. And that's one of my favorite optics out there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a huge Trigicon fan. I like the MRO. That's a good buy. I really yeah. like that. Oh, you can't wear like 400 and some bucks mm -hmm. now? Under Good $500? Buy. And I have that on the one you, the rifle you built for me. Chris built me, because we're both from the lovely state of New Jersey. Mm, he built me it. a Jersey compliant AR. <laughs> all right. Um, I'm going to have to post it on our. Not page. legally. By compliant, by it has the finger all over it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we had custom made uh, four inch hand guards for our rifles made. And uh, yes, it has the Jersey bird all over it. Um, we'll go more over that and we'll go over some training stuff uh, when we return. We'll be back in a minute. And we're back. Thanks for sticking with us. Um, just jump right back into it. So you're going to help this person get the right optics for their rifle sure. that you're going to custom build them. So, so the first thing you do is you come to me, I'm going to say, do you wanna, what do you want to use a gun for? I don't care about how much money you have. I don't care about yeah. where you've done or who you've partied with. You know, you came to buy a gun. Let's talk about the gun, right? So what are you going to do with it? You're going to hunt with it? You're going to go overseas with it. You're going to go shoot paper with it. You can do F class, right? So that's where we start with, right? And a lot of guys want the tactical gun. They want the Chris Kyle gun, like, right. like, And that's the hands down. I mean, I build F class. I build them all, right? That's one of the best type of setups you can use for hunting, tactical use for almost anything. It's very applicable. Um, so we go over what you're going to do with the gun. And then we have a conversation about the gun, right? Then we get into budget, right? We, we build your dream gun out, and then we go to about what what can you do from there, right? But and you're going to start around? 3,800. 3,800. 3, okay. Right. And it's not bad for a custom rifle. That's 
and right. expensive. And our, what's good about us is we make our barrels are interchangeable. So when you buy a gun from me in 308 and say in six months you want to do 6.5, our barrels are swappable in 10 minutes. That's sweet. Yeah. So from there, we have a conversation what you're going to use it for, how far you want to shoot. Then we, you know, that's where the caliber question comes in. Um, long action or, or short action. So if you're going to do any competition, you can't use magnum cartridges. Now, what exactly do you mean by long action, short action? Okay, so you have uh, short action your cartridge will be like um, 308, 6.5. It's under a, sh- a certain overall length, okay. right? And a certain uh, bolt head uh, size, right? So the, the, the round part of the case of the bullet, how wide that is, fits in the bolt of a lot of different calibers, right? So that would be in a short action. So there's okay. certain ones. Uh, long action is going to be like your magnum calibers, 300 Win Mag, 338 Lapua, think really long, big bullets, right? Yes. Um, 300 Win Mag being the most popular one. Now, a lot of people, fun fact, right? Sniper rifles from the U.S. Army and the Marine Corps Navy SEALs, right? Yeah. The Army uses a long action in the M24. That way they can convert it, right? The Marine Corps uses a short action in the M40, only for 308. The Navy SEALs use a long action so that they can convert it to 300 Win Mag. So they can bring their gun in. Chris Kyle could bring his gun in and say, hey, I don't want it to be 300 Win Mag. I want it to be 308. And they can pop that barrel off, which is a lot different with a Remington, the way we, the way they do it. Sure. But then it has to be head space chambered, blah, blah, blah. But then they can they have a whole team for that, and they can easily swap that out without having to buy different actions. That's pretty cool. And that's why they use a long action. The M, the M forty A one through A six from the Marine Corps is it's its own beast. You don't you know if you don't no. change that, it's three hundred eight or nothing. And that's you know one one to ten. Three hundred eight's a very popular round. Right, very popular. That's probably the most popular one we sell besides the three hundred blackout. Now I, but that's more for hunting nuisance. I'm doing the six millimeter Creedmoor in our gun, right? And that's a twenty six inch full barrel. Uh, I got a Mac Brothers bolt in that thing, XLR carbon chassis. I mean, it's it's soup to nuts. It's it's all the so way. So to build something like that, how much would that be? That'll be without glass, about forty five hundred. Yeah, that's right. still not bad. It's not bad at all. No. Considering now that gun will take you out far. That's take you as far as you want. Now, a lot of people will disagree with me on this, but three hundred eight is not the three hundred eight that your granddaddy had. Okay, there's nothing you cannot harvest in North, South, or Central America with the three hundred eight. There's nothing that cannot be taken. Right, every mm-hmm. animal that we see, eat, harvest. Can all be used 308 on, right? Okay. Now, back in the day, our granddads didn't have the ballistic technology that we have, the boat tailed rounds, the Sierra Match Kings, all the things that we oh, use nowadays. Oh, it's changed so much, everything. So back in the day, they used to tell us that it's like throwing a softball. You take the 308, you lob it out there at 800 yards. It's like just going 400 feet in the air and then dropping out of nowhere, which mm-hmm. couldn't be farther from the truth. So nowadays, we're actually found out that 308, you're looking at six degrees of separation off the earth. Not the movie, Joe. Six degrees of separation of the earth <laughs> in height wise from the ground, right? Okay. So how does that transfer, right? Well, we're gonna use terms like terminal ballistics, kinetic energy, right? Down uh velocities, things like that. So when we get at eight hundred yards, right, we're we're way supersonic. That means we're we're way going past the speed of sound, right? Yeah. So we're way past it. So there's no way it's gonna shut off. If I'm if I'm twelve feet off the ground at eight hundred yards per se, right? And I don't know if that measurement's correct, don't quote me to that, but if it's sure. only twelve feet off the ground, right? And, I, and I'm shooting it from that far away. There's no way it's just going to fall, right? Because you right. still have all that distance to cover. And in fact, we have shown pass through on live pigs at 1,700 yards with 308. Really? 1736 or 1760 is a mile. Holy cow! 60 yards short of a mile, we can kill a pig with a 308. I like bacon. And with the right rifle, <laughs> with the right scope, <laughs> and with the right instruction, you, Miss Lindsay, could shoot a mile shot with a 308 any day of the week. Let's do it. Mm-hmm. And instructions <laughs> is the key part here. Right. You so say you want the 308 rifle now, Wimpy? Let's do it. Okay. I'm sold. <laughs> now, any precision rifle, though, right? And you got to come see Joe to get these. You got the best store online for this stuff. Always recommend suppressor use. Now, I don't I don't believe in the whole stigma with the whole, you know, they're free assassins or whatever like that. Stop looking at suppressors like that. They're safety devices. They still make noise, folks. That's right. When we do our training classes, Lindsay, you teach a lot of classes as well. Right. We use a 22 suppressed. That's really to protect my hearing, but it's still loud. <laughs> you should see the reaction of people when they come in and we've got a 22 suppressed. It's kind of funny. Yeah, they think it's actually going to go pew pew. And <laughs> when you're 308s, your 65s, and your 6 mil, things like that, you're going to you're going to mitigate about 40 percent of your recoil. Yeah. So funny story. I took my wife out when we were dating first time to go I shoot hope guns. He took her out. Yeah. Well, 
Uh, I was going to say something, but I had to catch myself. Remember, she's going to be listening. So, <laughs> so we took her out. I took her out, and I, uh, I have an unorthodox way of teaching. So I went and I took her out and I put her behind a Savage, uh, Savage Model 10 308, right? Police, it's a police model, or whatever. Okay, yeah, yeah. And uh, she pulled the trigger on that and didn't want anything to do with guns ever again. That's so loud. Well, I said, "Look, honey, don't don't go nowhere. Sit down." At that time, it was old technology. I had a Gemtech, uh, some quick detach Gemtech thing. I don't know. It's old. This was like two thousand something, you know. Okay. Either way, so I click it on. She gets it all lined up. And this is at night's trail at the hundred yard range. I got the biggest looking smile from her, <laughs> right? And I said, you want it? She's go away. And she sat there for another hour. You lost your gun, didn't you? Yeah. And this girl, I mean, women are inherently better shooters with long guns. Always. They can control their emotions, their heart rate, everything better, their blood they pressure. concentrate. Right. So my wife was hooting hole in hole in 100 yards her first time on a bolt gun with a suppressor. No problem. She couldn't no. adjust it. She couldn't do nothing with it. But Yeah. Women naturally are better shooters. Oh, they are. I mean, right. all the classes that we teach, if there's one woman in the class, she's going to be the best shot of the class. Right. Especially with ball um, Us guys, we have limited uh, attention span. Right. You know, first we're shooting the target. Hey, look at us. Look at us. And we see, hey, look at her. Yeah. All of our attention goes to the lady that's at the range. <laughs> and then we see the squirrel. And it's all over with. We're Pretty gone. Much. Right. Yeah. Um, have you ever had somebody have one of your guns and say it's not accurate? They're not hitting the target. Uh, then you go and shoot and it. You hit the target. All guns that we have are factory <laughs> tested, and we we will show you, and we post test targets on Instagram, you know, mm -hmm. and we have customers well, that them. send us in their test targets. That one I told you about with the three shots in a triangle at 700 yards, guy yeah. shot it off a backpack. Really? Didn't even use a rest, nothing. Now, I'm not bragging, you know, because I didn't shoot it. I just okay. put it together. But you can still brag. <laughs> yeah. You're allowed to brag about the gun you built. Oh, it's, it's a darn nice gun. Yeah. <laughs> Again, just in gun shop life, I mean, you guys were there when the person came in recently talking about how their sights were off, but how great of a shot they are. Yeah, well, Glocks are from the factory. They're straight. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't want to brag, but I'm going to go ahead and brag. I'm yeah. a pretty good shot. Yeah, <laughs> that's – and I learned this back in racing. Hey, you didn't want to brag because you didn't want to let the cat out of the bag, but you never went there and bragged about how quick your bike was. You never want to go into a gun shop and tell people how good of a shot you are. Especially if you're right-handed and you tell everybody your gun shoots left. Yeah. Um, <laughs> your finger arcs, man. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't go straight. Long story short, nobody tried to embarrass the guy at all, but he's sitting there bragging about how good of a shot he was. I go in the back, shoot the gun, and you saw the target. Hole in hole. Yes. Um, he says he shoots just like me the same exact way. He goes back and shoots it. looks like he used a shotgun. <laughs> but he's been shooting for 20-plus years. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So if that guy's ever going to shoot you, step left. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's, it cracks you up. That's just gun shop life. When yeah. you do training, um, it's scary when people come in looking for certain bold action guns and what they want to do. And when you tell them what their prices are, mm -hmm. they're like, okay. Maybe yeah. not. Yeah. Maybe they come not. in and say, I want to shoot a mile, Chris. And I say, okay. It's going to be about four grand for your rifle, two grand for your scope, and a thousand in accessories. And I'll teach you how to do it for free because you bought it. Holy. Ch and it's, yeah, Me. it's yeah. expensive. <laughs> yeah. But that's the same guy that'll come in six weeks later and buy a $12,000 Barrett setup yeah. because it's a Barrett. <laughs> and it's a 50 cal. I'm realizing what, it's a seven bucks around. Or the semi auto machine gun, whatever the yeah. hell that thing was. <laughs> yeah, it's. I don't know. I think I need a good bolt action gun now. Mm. You need one? I do. That's why I'm afraid to bring mine here to show you, because you're going to be like, you're not getting this back. <laughs> that might happen. <laughs> but I, why not? Yeah. No, I think I'd probably do it in 308. That's fine. I got I got two barreled actions in 308 coming up okay. in the next couple weeks. And the only reason I say that is because I just like keeping things simple, mm. and it's easy to find 308 ammo. Now, we average like 3,800 for a custom build, right? Mm. But that's not saying that's you know where to start. I mean, our barreled actions, you're going to look at between 16 to 2 grand. Yeah. And then you can pick out your trigger. You can pick out your stuff. Your stock or your chassis is what's – that's where the money's at. Oh, I want mine cool looking. Your Magpul chassis that we can get – you know, Magpul's got a couple new ones coming out, right? But the the Hunter, 700 Hunter, it's like the best bang for your buck. So it's got a big V-wedge bed in it. It's aluminum. But it's it's solid. They're accurate. They're like 250 right? But the one on this gun I'm building right now for you is like – it retails over a grand. It's made of completely carbon fiber. It's 27 ounces. That's something for me then. Right. So I mean, you're. Hey, talking, I like carbon fiber, and it's going to be light. And, <laughs> and that's the thing. These PRS guns, age. you're looking at a four to six pound rifle for a bolt gun versus, you know, Chris Kyle's guns, thirty two pounds, give or take. Thirty two. Uh, they're they're heavy. 
Imagine having to hike with that. I just uh-huh. back in the day hiking with the M1. Mm-mm. No, or, sir. Were they 14 pounds? Yeah, and then all the ammo with the clips. Oh, the clips. <laughs> and that's a gun that actually takes a clip. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I couldn't imagine that. The standard AR is what, seven pounds? Yeah. Well, they were farm boys back then. They ate a lot. You know, they worked hard in three meals. We're not farm boys, farm boys, but we, I'm well fed. Well fed, <laughs> definitely. Don't have to be a farm boy to eat a lot, right? No, ma'am. No one did. Would you carry the uh, thirty-pound rifle, uh, three hundred yards running? No. You get her a cart. No. Yeah, I'd run the golf cart. Oh, not yeah. at all. Oh yeah, a little buggy or something like things that. Do it that way. Things gonna be as big as I am at that point. But, but it's not just that; <laughs> it's the bags too. You gotta buy a lot of bags. So, like, you're in PRS, you can use whatever's on you. So you'll see these guys running around, and they have different pillows, basically, bags with stuff in them. Like and every Armageddon gear makes some of the best ones, I think. Mm-hmm. Tom makes some of the best stuff. Please look at them for PRS bags. Um, also, uh, WeBad. WeBad make a thing that kind of looks like a... WeBad? W-E-I-B-A-D. Yeah. <laughs> they make this thing. It's called a fortune cookie, and it literally looks like a fortune cookie. Tell you from, are they from Jersey as well? No. <laughs> I wish. <'Cause> WeBad. <laughs> well. that, that we, their, their fortune cookie thing is incredible. Um, but basically what I'm talking about is, is, is a, rest, a, a, a bag for a rest. Yes. So you'll see guys with huge ones. Like there's girls smaller than you in PRS that have bags that are two foot by two foot that when they are sitting down it sits right here so they can square off right. on the gun so basically folks are resting their support arm right on this two foot bag and there's different sizes they're they're two inches to two foot to i mean the, the options it, you have to find what works for you oh yeah you know? now listen how does somebody get a hold of you they want to build something they want to do anything coat something whatever the best way if you want to get coating done or whatnot and you're in the bradenton area for now is to go over and get a, get in touch with ages tactical joe jc Lindsay, all these guys over here can help you out and get in touch with me um plus we're an appointment only base shop so if you need it done right now your best bet is to get to Joe and give it to him and tell him you need it right away because he doesn't let me slack. He'll call me up and say, I'm dropping this off. I need it tomorrow. It's important. He paid extra. And, <laughs> and you've done that. I've dropped stuff off right. for you at 7 o'clock at night and 7 o'clock in the morning, it's ready to go. But I will work all night long if, if yeah. it takes it. Yeah. You have a work ethic. I love it. So, But the best way, if you want to get a hold of me, um, contact our business page, Title2MFG, and it's the number two um, title, number two MFG. That's on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, We'll put all the links in the okay. bottom yeah. of this video. You can DM me through Instagram. I don't check Instagram as, as much as Facebook, but Neither do I. Um, the, the Facebook's the best way. You can also call us, 941-228-3362. Um, set up an appointment, and you can come by, and we can talk about a lot of stuff. You know, We work hand-in-hand with Joe at his silencer shop store for all of our silencers. Um, we can do custom builds, coatings, you know. Yeah, I definitely. I, I restored a smudge pot for a guy a few weeks ago. So, I mean, it's not just guns we do. <laughs> you know, we do yeah. anything. Oh, yeah, I know. Listen, if you want to check out our Facebook page, Talking Guns with Joe, you'll see all the contact information for Chris over at Title II Manufacturing. You'll have our contact information. And, of course, you can watch the video right now because we're one good-looking group right here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Folks, have a great night, and we will talk to you next week. Thank night. you. Night.